Welcome back to the Traditional Thomas. For those of you tuning in for the very first time, welcome. My name is Nicholas Cavazos. It's good to have you here. Here for episode three, covering this great new catechism, Catechism Credo, a compendium of the Catholic faith by His Excellency Bishop Athanasius Schneider. If you guys haven't gotten this catechism already, what are you guys doing, right? It's a great catechism. I thoroughly recommend it. It's going to be in the link in the description below. Go ahead and check out that catechism. I think it's like $20, $25 or something like that. Very, very affordable for especially the contents that you get inside of it. Today, we're going to be going ahead and diving into, I think it's considered lesson two, but it will be our third episode, right? Episode number three. And we're going to be discussing uh, the greatest mystery, really, of the Catholic faith, which is the mystery of the Holy Trinity. As you can see, actually, this video is a little bit shorter. Um, than the last two because this chapter is actually a little bit shorter than the remaining two that we have gone ahead and gone through. However, I'm going to be going ahead and showing you guys two um, separate, I guess you could say, supplementary helps when understanding this trinity. Number one is going to be the Athanasian Creed. We've talked about that a little bit yesterday in the discussion or in the last episode rather on the discussion on Catholic creeds and what is the creed? Remember, it's a summary of belief that the church, right, the mystical body of Christ gives us the faithful in order to help us understand the once and for all deposit of Christ. Um, but then also we're going to be going ahead and looking at actually the preface, right, the Latin mass preface for the Most Holy Trinity, which is used on essentially all Sundays of the year, right, the vast majority of them. And so therefore, um, we're going to look at two of these things, as well as a couple more things, and we'll dive into it. Before we go ahead and do so, though, make sure and give the, a like to this video and subscribe. If you're not a part of the Traditional Thomas, we'd be glad to have you. Also, if you would consider donating to the said work of the Traditional Thomas, you can go over to patreon.com slash traditional Thomas, or you can see the link in the description below. Donating and sharing, those two things specifically help so much more than you guys know. One, because it allows this content really to be shed everywhere where it really needs to be, especially in our day, which there's just mass confusion about what the Catholic faith is and what Catholics are supposed to believe. But also through donating, especially, it allows me to take more time and actually focus on making these videos to provide you, the viewer, right, and all of the faithful with the beauty and richness of the traditional Catholic faith. So doing both of those things, 110% appreciated. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and dive into today's lesson. But before we do so, let's go ahead and invoke Our Lady, right, the Queen of the Most Holy Rosary for the success of this show. And we'll dive in. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of the Rosary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, so here we are at chapter two, right? The Blessed Trinity, the mysteries in general. So go ahead, if you guys have not already, go back and watch episodes one and two if you're wanting to be caught up to speed on where we're at. We're going to be going ahead and diving now into the Blessed Trinity, right? Which is really the great mystery of mysteries of the Catholic faith. And thankfully, His Excellency, goes ahead and starts off here, right, with our first question, question 61, what is a mystery, right? A mystery is a truth that is impossible for any creature, right, that includes not just the animals, but really particularly in this context, us, right, human beings and the angels, to fully comprehend or explain, right? A truth that is impossible for any creature to fully comprehend or explain. Some mysteries are natural, Others are supernatural, right? When it comes to this particular context, right, the Trinity is a supernatural mystery. And this is something that is impossible for created beings, right, namely angels and 
humans to fully comprehend or to fully explain. If you remember from yesterday, remember God is infinite. He is all power. He is, he is all powerful. He's everywhere, etc. And so therefore, we creatures who are limited in our faculties, we have a finite intellect, a finite understanding of everything. We have a limited understanding of the world around us. We can't fully comprehend the, the zenith, the way of who or what God is. Uh, and neither can we fully explain it. Now, we can explain certain things, right, through what divine revelation has given us. So remember that God has given mankind through the Catholic Church divine revelation, but we can't fully still comprehend it. We can understand elements, but we fully we can't fully comprehend it or explain it, right? This is, again, also one of those mysteries, right, that being the Trinity, as well as things along the nature of the Incarnation, that we can't know through natural reason alone. So remember, we can know certain things by natural reason, right? For instance, that God exists, that he's all providential, the immortality of the human soul, but we can't know from reason the reality of the Trinity or the incarnation, things along that nature. So therefore, the Trinity and the incarnation are properly so-called a mystery, right? Something that we fully can't understand through natural means. Question 62, he dives and he says, are there men, are there any true mysteries or has our knowledge simply not advanced enough, right? Some people kind of assert, well, maybe we could get to a point in the quote development of doctrine where we can fully understand every element that there is when it comes to these sacred mysteries, right? The answer of that is going to be no. It says right here, because every created mind is finite, there will always be limits it cannot pass, and truths that it can never fully comprehend, right? This is something, again, that's very important because a mystery, right? These eternal mysteries are always going to be mysteries to the finite intellect, right? Now, just because they're mystery doesn't mean that they're not true, right? It just means that our capacities, right, our faculties for knowing these things can't grasp them in its totality, right? That's what it means. When we look at question 63 now, it says, are there some things mysterious to man even in the natural world, right? Is there things in this natural physical world that we find mysterious? He says, yes, such as the union of the soul and body or the irreducible complexity of cellular life, right? I want to focus particularly on that union of the soul and the body for a second, right? What makes man's body alive? Right. Some might say, well, it's his blood pumping through the use of his organs. Right. Some people might say the heart, etc. But really, when you think about it, you could really take a step back even with that and say, well, what makes the heart beat? What makes the blood pump? Right. What makes the organs alive? Right. There has to be some life force inside of, if you will, or attached to man that is causing his body to live, that is causing his body to be alive. And this is the soul, right? So a human being is two fundamental parts, right? He is a body, a physical corporeal body, if you will, as well as a rational soul. A rational soul means a soul that is able to contemplate through the power of the intellect, as well as a soul that is able to choose through free will, right? So we have a body and a soul, right? A physical body and an incorporeal, meaning a non-physical soul. And our soul is made up of intellect and will. Now, this intellect and will that we have, right, this rational soul that we have, we also share with the angels, right, to a certain extent. Although angels are oftentimes depicted as creatures who have physical bodies, right, particularly in Catholic works of art, which there's nothing wrong with, angels don't have bodies innate to their nature, now, they can assume a body, and we do see this in the context of Scripture. We do see also this in the context of private revelations, but we, they don't have a body innate to their nature as we do, right? We human beings have a body innate to their nature. However, angels do have a rational soul, right? They do have intellect and will, although their modes of understanding are going to be more developed and more complex than ours. We'll get into some of those details when we hit that section on the angels uh, in a couple lessons. But that being the case, right, angels and man both made in the image and likeness of God, right, to be made in the image and likeness of God, according to St. Thomas, according to St. Augustine, is that we have intellect and will, as well as this is what separates us from the animals. 
what makes the animals alive? What makes the trees and the plants alive? Well, animals and plants also have souls, right? Soul is a life force or the form of the body. So animals and trees have souls, but they're not going to be like our souls. They're not rational souls that can contemplate, that can choose, right? We see the animals have what's called the sensitive soul, meaning a soul that has mobility innate to its nature, right? Um, that has instinct innate to its nature. And then when we look at the plants, we see the plants and the trees that they don't have uh, mobility, right? In the context of, you know, moving around, uh, if you will, in the, in the same way that animals or humans will, but they still are living. And so therefore they have what's called a vegetative soul, meaning a certain simple life force or a simple soul. And so it's very important for us because though we can understand these things through reason, right? Like for instance, we can know that there is the immortality of the soul, fully understanding how the soul and the body are unified are going to be complex. And we can see this, um, you know, because it, it involves natural truths, but yet it is still in a certain sense, mysterious. Question 64, he says, what should we therefore conclude? In this finite world, uh, contains so many things that we cannot fully comprehend. We should not be astonished to find mysteries in regard to God, who is infinite right? It's a very good thing to want to understand Catholic theology, but we also have to understand that in understanding Catholic theology, there's only so much that we finite creatures can understand, and so therefore we should give ourselves in complete trust and obedience over to God, who is an infinite and all-loving being, right? We have to trust him. What is a mystery of religion? A supernatural truth revealed by God that we must believe, although we can never completely understand or demonstrate it with our reason, right? And he gives exactly some examples that I've been giving. For instance, what is the principal mysteries of religion, right? We see the Blessed Trinity, the Incarnation, and the Redemption, right? Those are going to be the principal, principal mysteries of our faith that we fully can't um, understand or demonstrate with just reason alone. Now, just because we can't demonstrate them fully with reason does not mean that they're irrational, right? It just means that they are above the rational order. That's all that it means, which is, in a certain sense, uh, a rational thing to understand, even if you still don't understand the full contents of that mystery. Now, he gets into specifically the mystery of the Blessed Trinity, which is going to be kind of the meat of our study today. He says, the mystery of the Blessed Trinity. What is the mystery of the Blessed Trinity? The meaning, the Holy Three, right, the Blessed Trinity, is the mystery of one God in three distinct co-equal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? These are very important and key words that he's using here, right? And so the Blessed Trinity is uh, a mystery because it's one God, right, one in essence, one in nature, yet three distinct persons, and these persons are co-equal, meaning that there's not a, a certain hierarchy like God the Father has more power than God the Son, and God the Son has more power than God the Holy Ghost, right? That's an error. Rather, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are all equal, right? One God in essence and nature, three co-equal persons. Question 68 says, how do we know this mystery, right? How can we know this mystery about God? We can only know this by divine revelation, as God has revealed himself to man, right? Remember, God who can neither deceive nor be deceived has revealed through divine revelation to his one Catholic church the reality that he is one God in essence and in nature and three co-equal persons, right? And so this is how we know that um, this God exists, right, specifically in this form format, if you will, because of divine revelation, right? Again, not through natural revelation, natural knowledge. Now, he says in this, uh, is each of the three persons God, right? Or each of the three persons God? The answer to this, of course, is yes. Yes, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, right? They are all God. It is one God in three persons. Are there three divine persons? Are the three divine persons three different gods? Right. That's sometimes an accusation that you hear, especially Muslims bring up. The answer to this is no. They are not three gods, but one and the same God. They are consubstantial, having the same divine nature and substance. Right. We see this, of course, in the Nicene Creed that we hear chanted in the traditional Mass on Sundays, right, and on feast days. That God is one in essence and nature, 
consubstantial, right? Having the same divine nature and substance, right? Again, being a God who is three co-equal persons in the one essence and the one nature. Again, this is something that it can be highly complex, but this is also kind of the nature of God. If you were to do kind of a natural analogy, we can know so much about, for instance, the nature of a tree, right? Or the nature of a dog. But because those things are lower than even our nature, um, we can understand things about it. God is infinite. We can't even comprehend the idea of an infinite, right? But we can understand the idea of a first efficient cause, a final cause, etc. And so therefore, when we receive through the Catholic Church this divine revelation that God has given mankind, we can believe it with assurance because it's God who reveals it, and he can neither deceive nor be deceived. Question 71 is, is there any one of the divine three divine persons older or more powerful or more perfect? Well, if we're paying attention, right, the answer is no, right? The three divine persons are co-equal in eternity, in omnipotence, perfection, and all other things except what properly individuates each person as such. We'll get into specifically what that means, but this means that all three divine persons, right, are eternal. They're all omnipotent. They're all uh, containing all perfection. They have all justice, all holiness, all mercy, all love, all truth, all beauty, all goodness. But yet at the same time, it says right here, except what properly individuates each person person as such. We'll get into specifically what that means in a second. He says right here, question 72, are the three divine persons really distinct and yet united? Yes, right? They are distinct only in the relations that distinguish them, right? All things in God are one, and there is no opposition of relation. There is a distinct person of the Father, a distinct person of the Son, and a distinct person of the Holy Ghost. And yet these are really all united in one essence and nature, right? One God in three persons. When we look now, for instance, at question 73, what personal properties, right, distinguish the three persons from one another? So remember, we were talking about up here in question 71, that there are, whenever it says here, is any one of the three persons older, yet more powerful, more perfect, right? The answer is no. Then we talked about except what properly individu in individuates each person as such. When we're looking at that, what properties distinguish the three persons from one another? How can we distinguish the three persons of the Blessed Trinity? The answer is but one, the Father proceeds from no principle, right? But is the principle of the other two persons, right? So the Father, right? God the Father does not proceed from any principle, right? But is the principle of the other two persons of the Holy Trinity. The Son, right? The Divine Son is begotten of the Father and has no principle but the Father, right? So remember this term begotten, as the creed says, begotten, not made, right? So this is not saying that Christ was made of the Father and then therefore proceeds from him, no, but rather he was begotten, not made, right? Consubstantial with the Father. And he has, right, as it says right here, the Son is begotten of the Father and has no principle but the Father, right? So the principle of the Son is the Father. And then third, right, the Holy Spirit, right, the Holy Ghost proceeds from both the Father and the Son, as from one principle, right? This key phrase right here, and the Son, has been uh, a sticking point of contention for the Roman Catholic Church, right? The true Church of Jesus Christ from the Schismatic Orthodox, right? Who deny this, con uh, this um, I would say, clause of the Nicene Creed that's commonly called the Filioque, right? We see this, of course, in the Sunday Missal, in the Nicene Creed on Sundays and Holy Days, right? This phrase, uh, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son as from one principle, right? This is Catholic doctrine. And this, of course, is found in the great majority and all of the teachings of the early church fathers, right? Now, this is a, a thing of hot dispute, but I actually recommend people go and check out my friend Eric Ibarra's wonderful work on the Filioque if they're wanting to get really into this particular issue or go and read St. Thomas on it, right? St. Thomas has a very good answer when it comes to this question of the Filioque. Question 74 is, why are the three divine persons distinguished in this way? Because the Father eternally begets the Son, who is his word, his wisdom, and his perfect image. The Father and the Son together eternally breathe forth the Holy Spirit, right? This is such a rich 
question and such a rich answer because, right, the father eternally begets the son, right? So the father is eternally in outside of time with no beginning or end begetting the son who is his word, right? Meaning his wisdom, his perfect image, right? And the father and the son together outside of all time through eternally, right, are breathing forth the Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Spirit. This is a great mystery that is hard for us to even conceive of, but it's a beautiful one to say the least. Question 75, he gets more into some of these, um, if you will, distinctions when it comes to relation. He says, are the three divine persons separate from their external action? No, they concur equally and perfectly in all their external actions. Although creation is fittingly ascribed to the Father, right, it's fitting to describe it to the Father, redemption to the Son, and sanctification to the Holy Spirit, nevertheless, the incarnation and the redemption through the Trinitarian, although Trinitarian in origin and power, are the personal work of the Son in execution as he alone took flesh and died on the cross, right? So God the Holy Ghost did not take flesh and die on the cross. God the Father did not take flesh and die upon the cross, right? It was the personal work of God the Son, yet it was still Trinitarian in its origin and its power, right? It was not um, God the Holy Ghost, uh, excuse me, God the Holy Son, right? Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ going off uh, in a rogue way, right? This is something that is fully Trinitarian in origin and its power. Number 76 is is the mystery of the Holy Trinity contrary to reason, right? That might be something some of you guys are asking, right? And the answer to this is no, it is not. Although it is above our reason, right? It is supernatural. It is not contrary to reason itself, meaning irrational. The, if we understand the reality from reason alone that God exists and that the human soul is eternal, that God is providential, etc., right? If we can understand from reason alone without a shadow of a doubt this truth, and we understand that in that definition of God, that means that God is an eternal, infinite, omnipotent, omnipresent, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, all-just, all-merciful being, right? Who has no beginning, no end, that existence proceeds from, time proceeds from, etc. That he is his own existence through divine simplicity, etc. If we understand that all of that through reason, right, then it's completely rational to say we're not going to fully understand as created finite beings – that being in its totality. We're just not going to, right? We can understand um, God through his um, effects, right, if you will, but we're not going to understand God in his substance, right? But at the same time, it's not irrational, because if we've already established all these things through reason, it's not against reason to say, well, therefore, you know, uh, you know, three doesn't equal one and one doesn't equal three. It doesn't, it, you know, it, it's completely rational, although we can't fully explain it out, right? It is something that is supernatural or above our nature. Question 77, he gets into right here. He says, is this mystery entirely unintelligible, right? The answer to this is no. Although it is impossible to understand or explain completely, right, incomprehensible, it is not entirely impossible to understand or explain in some way. We can form some idea of it through analogy, right? And you see many analogies given. For instance, you see St. Patrick with the three-leaf clover. You also see some modern examples when it comes to water being able to be, uh, you know, solid, liquid, and gas at the same time and in the same place. Um, you see this these analogies. All of these analogies, of course, are imperfect, right? There's no perfect analogy of the Trinity because there's no um, perfect created substance that you can liken to an eternal, uncreated self-existent being um, but at the same time you can only go so far and you can at least go to a point where we can grasp it a little bit easier and now he gets into this one this is very interesting what analogies does saint augustine offer for the mystery of the holy trinity right and this is something i remember actually going through undergrad it's very fascinating it says right here the unity of man's memory intelligence and will right this is the analogy that saint augustine offers right man's memory intelligence and will and then he's quoting here from Augustine. He says, when we speak of them seemingly, even what pertains to one of them is done by all. After all, memory alone does not produce a speech which we produce from memory. Rather, intelligence and will cooperate in producing it. Although it pertains only to memory, it is quite easy to see what is what this with regard to the to others as well. For whatever intelligence of itself speaks, 
It does not uh, without memory and will, and whatever the will of itself says or writes, it does not do without intelligence or memory, right? This is a great analogy, right? So if we're choosing to do something um, with our will, our intelligence and memory are going to be, um, if you will, right there working alongside of it. Same thing when it comes to the other said faculties using that in an analogy. Then in his final question that we'll at least wrap up for today in this chapter, he says, question 79, what are the principal religious errors regarding the Holy Trinity, right? There's been many heresies, particularly in the early church and even in the reform, the, the so-called Reformation time period in which um, various heresies about the divine nature of the Son and of the Holy Trinity um, have been thrown around. So you see right here, for instance, Arianism and Macedonianism. Right, these were fourth century heresies restrict uh, restricting the true divinity to the Father and denying the eternal divinity of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right, we see that very clearly in the church, particularly in the Arian crisis. Right, in the fourth century, which believed that um, Christ was not uh, eternal and coequal and consubstantial with the Father, but rather he was. Um, you know, created by God, the Father, etc. You see the same thing, of course, with the Holy Spirit when it comes to Macedonianism, right? You also see, in as an example, Islam and contemporary um, Judaism, right? Various Unitarian sects and modernism within the Catholic Church all reject, uh, all of which reject God's self-revelation as a trinity and divine consubstantial persons, right? All of these various heretical groups do this. You see, especially when it comes to, for instance, Islam, right, denies the Trinity, believes that Christ was only a prophet, right, and therefore uh, falls apart in the um, contemporary Judaism, which is nothing to do with um, Old Testament Judaism. You see the complete denial of the Son, um, as well as the reality of um, th the belief that uh, God is not a, tr a triune being. This is something that, of course, you see the Apostle St. John speak of in his first epistle when he says, um, and, I, and I quote this because there is kind of, a, I would just say, a, a popular modern notion that, um, that, the, the, that the Hebrew people believe in God the Father, but not God the Son, right? That's incorrect because First John says, um, you know, if you don't have the Father, then you don't have the Son, right? So he who uh, confesses the Father also has to confess the Son. He who denies the Son denies the Father also, etc. Right? Unitarianism, of course, right, does not believe in a, a triune God, or I would say anything really nowadays. Unitarianism doesn't really believe in anything. Uh, and then modernism, of course, which is the idea that religion is not something objective outside of man, but something that is um, subjective and internal in its origin, and therefore should be. Um, through our religious sentiment, religion should conform itself to our internal religious desires. What does that sound like? Uh, hashtag synodality. Uh, um, it's exactly what you see going on in many um, parts of the conciliar church. Um, sometimes when it comes to the Trinity, you see that particularly in more classical forms of modernism. Um, but I would also say in uh, other various elements of even contemporary neo-modernism, you see that. And then the third example he gives right, is that uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, right, pantheonism, and all other systems that reject the simplicity and unity of God, uh, God's independence from creatures, right, so pantheonism, of course, is the belief that God and basically all existence are one and the same, right, Hinduism, that there is, um, you know, in a certain sense, kind of a, a universal um, God that's not a personal being, but kind of in a pantheistic way encompasses all things and expresses itself in a, a billion different forms that you could you could technically call gods in the little sense. Buddhism, of course, right, following in tangent with something similar with that, but of course being the you know uh, more ascetical form of um, the thought of uh, of the original Buddha. The problem with, of course, all of those three forms is that none of them are technically religions because in order to be truly a religion, you have to be uh, have a relation to a personal being. And if there is no such personal being, then there's no way to have a true relation to that personal being, and therefore it's not really a religion. It's just a cult, frankly. Um, that's all that it is. And I don't say cult in the in the sense of like, oh, you know, I'm bashing the billions of people that believe in this over the head, but a cult in the sense of well, it's, it's a cultist of belief that – um, I would say is irrational, right? Doesn't make sense on the philosophical level alone. And I can say that as a non-Catholic, right? I, I am a Catholic and I believe that fully, but I don't have to be a Catholic in order to assent to that. I just have to understand the basic definition of religion. All right, so here we are now, uh, now are at catholictradition.org, which is a fairly good website overall. It has a lot of good just 
Catholic prayers and resources. But I want to go ahead and show you guys the Athanasian Creed, right? This was the creed that St. Athanasius wrote in the time of the Arian heresy, which we've already mentioned. And I wanted to bring this up because this is a good creed to know, even if you don't memorize this massive uh, beast of a thing, if you will, it's still good to know and to keep in the back of your head, right? And so you're going to see many Trinitarian um, as well as other mysteries um, that St. Athanasius brings up. He says, for instance, whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary to hold the Catholic, right? Apostolic universal faith, which except everyone shall have kept whole and undefiled, right? Remember what we talked about when it comes to who truly is a Catholic and who is not, right? Everyone has to keep this whole and undefiled. Without a doubt, he will perish eternally, right? So this is the days before the modern um, errors of ecumenism that we see, uh, not just Vatican II proclaiming, but also all the subsequent issues that come forth from that. He says, now the Catholic faith is this. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Spirit. But of the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, it is one, right? E the glory uh, equal, the majesty co-eternal. He gets on and he says, as such, as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated, the Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite, right? It's going through these differing uh, attributes that we talked about, these different perfections, right? The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal, and yet there are not three eternals, right? But one eternal. There is also not three infinites, nor three uncreated, nor three, but one uncreated and one infinite. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, and the Holy Spirit is almighty, yet there is not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit, God, and yet not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son, Lord, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, and yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. And likewise, as we have been, we are compelled by the Christian religion to acknowledge every person by himself to be both God and the Lord. So are we forbidden by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or three lords. The Father is made of one, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not uh, created, but begotten. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and the Son, not made, nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. So there is one father, not three fathers, one son, not three sons, and the Holy Spirit, and not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, there is nothing before or after, nothing greater or less, but the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. And uh, so that in all things, it is therefore the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity to be worshiped. He therefore who wills to be in the state of salvation let him think thus on the Trinity, right? And now he builds on this, the other mysteries that we mentioned. But it is necessary to eternal salvation that he also confess faithfully the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The right faith, therefore, is that we must believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man. He is God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and he is man of the substance of his mother, born in the world. Perfect God, perfect man, subsisting of the reasoning soul and human flesh, equal with the Father as touching his Godhead, inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who, although he will be, uh, although he be God and men, yet he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by conversion of the Godhead in the flesh, but by taking of the but by taking of the manhood of God, one altogether, not by confusion of substance, but by unity of persons. For as the reasoning soul and the flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. And then he finishes up here, right, with these last two statements. Who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead at whose coming all men shall rise again with their bodies and shall give account of their own works. And they, have done, and they that have done good shall go into life eternal, and they that have done evil unto eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith, which except a man shall be, have believed faithfully and firmly, he cannot be in the state of salvation. 
This is the Athanasian Creed, right? This is a very good and lengthy explanation of the Most Holy Trinity, as well as the, uh, the reality of the Incarnation. And notice how this is the Catholic faith, which except a man have believed faithfully and firmly, right? We're supposed to believe this faithfully, continually, and firmly, not shirking, not falling off into heresy, right? If we do these things, uh, we shall be saved. But if we don't, right, we cannot be in the state of salvation. Second here, this is the preface of the Holy Trinity that you see on most Sundays in the traditional Mass, right? I want to go ahead and bring this up because there's a lot of you guys who go to the traditional Mass, and you guys hear this chanted every week. And I thought it would just be a good idea after all of this Trinitarian knowledge that we've been learning for you to see a little bit play out. So right in the context of the Holy Mass, remember the priest says, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. All of this in Latin, of course. But then he says, right, in Latin, it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. Notice that, right, it is according to justice, right? It is truly right and just. And it's our duty and our salvation, right? So it's something that is just to do, right, in, for our relation to God. Remember, the virtue of religion is our relation to God. So it's just, but it's also our duty and the method in which we'll be saved always and everywhere, right, to give God thanks. Remember the, the admonition of St. Paul, which he says, in all things give thanks. You see this both in 1 Thessalonians 5 as well as in Colossians chapter 2, right? You also see Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, right, recognizing this reality of the one God. But then he goes on into some, or they go on rather, into some very good Trinitarian concepts. For with your only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, not in the unity of a single person, remember, because it's three persons, but in the trinity of one substance. I love the, the poetic way, right? Remember, God is one in substance in nature, but three in persons, right? So not in unity of a single person, right, because it's three, but in a trinity of one substance, right? A trinity, three persons, in one substance, right, in one nature. For what you have revealed to us of your glory, right? Remember, because this is through revelation that we understand this. We believe equally of your Son and of the Holy Spirit, so that in confessing of the true and eternal Godhead, remember, we as Catholics have to believe and confess, right? You might be adored, right? We give God latria in what is proper to each person, right? So we give God glory to each person in uh, their unity, in substance, and their equality in majesty, right? God is one in substance, but yet equal in divine majesty. For this is praised by the angels and the archangels, cherubim too and seraphim, who never cease to cry out each day as with one voice they acclaim, right? The angels, the nine choirs of angels, proclaim this each day. And then, of course, we know the famous Sanctus, right? Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, being that again that reference to what the people of Israel said to Christ coming into Jerusalem, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, as well as to many prophecies about the second person of the Holy Trinity, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Very fitting to have at the beginning, if you will, of the canon of the Mass. All right, everyone. So that's enough for today. What a powerful and interesting lesson, right? The Trinity is, again, the great mystery of the Catholic faith. It is one of those mysteries that we cannot fully comprehend, but has been given to us through the Catholic Church by the method of divine revelation by Almighty God himself. If you guys have not yet, go ahead and get yourself a copy of this work, right? Credo by Bishop Athanasius Schneider, right? A compendium of the Catholic faith. Absolutely amazing. You will not regret it. As we're going through this series, of course, there's going to be questions that he does not cover. And so if you guys have questions, uh, particularly about the subjects that we've learned, go ahead and put them in the description below, and I'll be happy to answer as many of them as I can. Um, at the end of the day, of course, right, make sure that you're praying for the good bishop because, again, this catechism, unfortunately, in the day in which we're in, is unfortunately controversial because there's a lot of... I would say, anti-friends of the Catholic faith and of tradition that don't like this catechism. So do yourself a favor, pray for the good bishop, right? He is a holy and saintly man, and get yourself a copy of this catechism. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching today. If you like this video, go ahead and give us a like, a thumbs up, and share it with your friends, right? Share it, 
all over the internet. Share it with your friends after mass. Go ahead and have these discussions with people at your parish, right? Introduce them to this catechism. Introduce them to this series. It's greatly appreciated. Sharing it is one of the best ways you can help. Also, if you don't mind, consider donating to the said work of the traditional Thomist over again at patreon.com slash traditional Thomist. The link will be in the description below. Through donating, it gives me not just the time and, and, and resources to be able to, to make this, but it also allows me to really take time and study and prepare and really make these episodes worthwhile, right? This is not the world's greatest YouTube show, but we really do need the Catholic faith now more than ever. And so your donations um, really allow me to help spread it out easier. So thank you so much for all of those you guys who do donate. And if you guys would like to donate, the link will be in the description. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, Mary Lord, bless you, Our Lady, keep you, and St. Joseph, watch over and protect you. God bless.